Well, good morning, church. Man, it's good to see you guys today. Would you stand? We're going to spend some time with Jesus. Let's sing praises to him.
Good morning, everyone. You guys can have your seats. Welcome to Believers. I am Rochelle, the Outreach Director here at Believers, and I am so excited that you have decided to spend your time here and worship together. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So we are really hopeful that today you all will be able to fully engage in this worship experience. And a great way to be able to do that is to go ahead and take out your devices and you can scan the QR codes on the back of your seats. And that's going to take you to a hub where you're going to be able to access things like downloading the Believers Church app and also your communication card and giving platforms. And we ask that everyone take advantage of this opportunity to fill out a communication card. When you do this, you're able to connect. Let us know that you're here, how we can be praying with you. And we're really excited for you to fill that out so we can know the next steps that you guys will be taking as a result of today's message. And also, if this happens, happens to be your very first time with us here at Believers, you can let us know that on the communication card. And we are so glad you're joining us. We'd love for you to also swing by Guest Central on your way out today after service. There you'll be able to pick up a gift bag that has some free goodies. So thank you so much for being here at your very first visit. And also, you guys, on this uh, communication card, you can let us know wonderful things that are going on in your life, like maybe you're interested in something like baptisms. And baptisms is a celebration of a decision to follow Jesus, which is really exciting. Best decision I ever made in my entire life. And if you guys are ready to uh, try a baptism, go ahead and make that big jump in your your faith journey, we invite you guys to be a part of the one that is happening next Sunday on July 24th. You can let us know that on your communication card as well. So recently, I uh, have been trying out this running group, and 200 people meet, and we go for a run, and we do a between three to five mile run on a Tuesday evening. It's really fun. And this past week, I decided that I was going to go by myself with my boys in my double running stroller. And I get there, and I'm psyching myself up. I'm like, I just... Him learning how to run with the double running stroller. It takes a lot of upper body strength. I don't know if y'all seen these arms. I don't have a lot of upper body strength. But we're running and they give us instructions and they say, hey, a lot of, a lot of this run is paved and then a lot of it is kind of, you know, it's a trail run. It's going to be some sand. So I start this run and I'm like, okay, it's all right. I got this. We're going. And then I get off the path and I go, oh, this is really not paved. And I'm like, that's okay. I got this. We're going to go, boys. And then the sand starts to get deeper and deeper deeper, but I have in my mind, I know where I'm going. I am on mission. I know what the finish line looks like. I know what they told me. So I keep running and running and the sand gets deeper and deeper. And we come to a creek and I say, I can't see any other runners out of the 200. And then this random stranger helps me lift the stroller over the water because I can't run through it. And the sand is deeper and I just start crying. And I'm like, I'm going to put my GPS on. I am going to finish this race no matter what because I know where I'm going and I finally get to the end and there's no water. They're all gone. I'm super behind because I was lost. And then finally, this guy comes over. He says, you were still out there? And I was like, yeah, I was still out there. And he goes, do you want some water? We ran out, but I'll get you some. And he brings me a water. And I was like, I'm really tired. It was really hard, but I finished because I knew I was coming back to this spot no matter what. And he looks at me and he says, you didn't take the stroller path. You went through the sand. You are awesome. (laughs) And I felt so strong and I just thought what we can accomplish when we know what we are working towards. Even I felt like I had to channel my ancestors in Africa, y'all, when I was on that path. But I knew where I was going and I knew where I had come from, you guys. And today, as we continue our summer concert series, we are going to look at mission and purpose with Pastor Tyler. And we are in for a treat. The band is about to perform a number for us, and they are going to keep us focused on purpose. You guys sit back, relax, and enjoy. Some quiet comfort 
morning y'all wasn't that awesome that was so cool man they don't let me on the band because they know I can't sing but praise God people that can that's what I say so yes but uh my name is Tyler I'm the next steps pastor here and I'm so excited to get into God's word with y'all this morning and uh but before I do that I'm just thinking about Africa my mind just goes to really any other country so like missions taking the gospel from wherever it is to somewhere else and continuing to spread God's kingdom. And when I think about the mission that God has us on as believers, it can be tough to stay on task and on target when you don't see the big vision in the big picture. And so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today is like, what is our purpose? Like, what are we here for? And so, but before I get to all that, I want to 
ask y'all a couple questions. So what gets you out of bed in the morning? Uh, today, maybe it was just to come to church. During the week, maybe it is to, to work because you got bills to pay, kids to feed, all that stuff. Maybe you fight crime like Batman. I have no idea. But I would imagine that everybody has what they would say, some kind of purpose or reason to get up in the morning. But at the end of the day, I would argue that most of us in this room want more out of life than this. You work to save up enough money so that you don't have to work, and then you live off of that money not working until you die. I think, I would hope that a lot, a lot of us in this room would want more out of life than that, because that sounds pretty terrible if that's all that there is. And so we could talk about so many other things, so many big questions around this, but the question that we're talking about today is this, is what are we here for? And so there are a ton of ways to debate that. Like we could sit here and talk about philosophy, so many other things about trying to answer that question. But for me this morning and for y'all, I just kind of want to lean on someone that I, I would argue that we could all trust as Jesus. I'm just going to lean on what he has to say about this question. And so to do that, let's go to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to be reading verses 34 to 40. And that says, so when the Pharisees heard that when he, being Jesus, had silenced the Sadducees, they came together. And one of them, an expert in the law, asked a question to test him. He said, teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, being Jesus, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. And so the way that Jesus answered that question, we'll, we'll, we will get to that. But I think it's so important for us, again, talking about the big picture, like we're reading a letter that was written for us, but not to us, if that makes sense. It was written in a very specific context, and so it can be difficult to understand and get what's going on and the impact without seeing the bigger picture. So as I said before, the author of this text is Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. And so Matthew was a tax collector. And so what that means is he would tax his own people for the Roman government, and he got rich off of that. Like ridiculously, he had paper. Whatever they had, coins, he, he had it. And so Matthew was not liked in his context. To, in, in fact, to give you an example, we have kind of a real, maybe a real-life example of this happening right now. So God forbid Russia was actually able to occupy, like fully occupy Ukraine. God forbid that happened. But, so say that did happen, and say a couple years go by, and a Ukrainian person starts to work for the Russian government to tax his own people, like working for the IRS department of the Russian government. That would be terrible. And that person would not be liked at all by his own Ukrainian people. That is exactly who Matthew is. That's exactly who he is. And yet, Jesus calls him into his disciples to be part of a crew. So like, Matt, so like Peter, Andrew, James, and John were fishermen. They most likely would have been taxed by Matthew at some point in their lives. And yet, Jesus brings all these men together with his love, his forgiveness, reconciliation of relationship, it is a beautiful picture of the gospel, even in that. So that's Matthew. And so he is, he's writing this gospel. He's able to, to tell the life and events of Jesus. And at this point in the gospel, so Jesus has been teaching, he's been preaching, doing miracles, all those things, garnering fame, really, and some, some, bad, some bad people did not like him at all. Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so as he's gaining this notoriety, at this point, he is already in Jerusalem about to face the crucifixion and the resurrection. That's what's about to happen. But he's talking to a group of people here. And so he just, like, like the Bible said, he, he roasted the Sadducees. And so then come the other group, the Pharisees, who are part of the Sanhedrin, the whole religious order of that day. And so they, one of their law experts comes to him with the question, 
what command in the law is the greatest? And these rabbis and teachers and Pharisees would debate these questions because whatever law was the greatest command, Torah was everything in that day. So whatever command was the greatest, like that is my purpose in life. That's why I'm here. And so it's a very Jewish way to ask the same question we're asking today. What are we here for? And Jesus responds with the Shema, which would have been known by every Jew in that day. They would have recited it a bunch of times in the day. And it sums up in these two commands, which are to love God and to love your neighbor as yourself. And so after he gives that response, he points to the law and the prophets to give the big picture of what all that encapsulates. And looking at the big picture helps keep us on task and on target, just like Rochelle running through sand with a baby show. I don't know how she did that, but she did it because she had her eyes on the prize. And so to give an illustration about that, my, my wife is so much better at that than me, like keeping her eyes on a goal and not worrying about the messiness of life. So when we were wedding planning, you know, I, she, she loved all the, the decorations and the buying people food, which costs a lot of money. And, uh, you know, the venue and, like, all the little things. Like, like y'all, we, she had me making candles and, can, like, all this stuff. And I loved every minute of it. I did not at all. At all did not love any of it. And what was really cool about her, though, she, her heart is so gold. And she just kept reminding me, I need you to look at the vision of seeing our families come together, having a great time celebrating our union. You know, I could not see it. Didn't want to see it. I was just so upset that I had to make candles for two weeks, you know. But at the, when we got to the wedding day, y'all, it was an amazing, beautiful day. It was just as she described. And she was able to keep her mind and eyes on the prize, and she didn't worry about the messiness of life, including me, upset about candles. And it was a beautiful day because she was able to keep her eyes on the prize. And so that's what Jesus is doing in this text. He's saying, y'all, this is God's big plan. All the law and the prophets point to this. And so what in the world does he mean when he says that? So the law is the first five books of, or the Torah. So you look in your Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that is what he's talking about, the law, the Torah. And so Pointing from there when he says the prophets. So in Israel, a Jew would have said anybody who's written scripture is a prophet because a prophet is a mouthpiece of God. And so when he's talking about the law, verse five books, and the prophets, he's talking about first and second kings, history, talking about poetry, Psalms and Job. He's talking about the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah. So he's saying this is God's huge plan. We were always intended to love God and love our neighbor as ourself. And so by Jesus saying that, that that sums up everything, that is amazing because it helps us to keep a big mission, vision, purpose. Now, that was also Israel's mission, vision, and purpose. However, they were not able to do that. So from creation of humanity, you got the rebellion, sin, God comes and saves the day, He chooses a family, Abraham, and that is where Jesus comes from eventually, Israel, Abraham, Israel, and then Jesus. And so when you think about that huge, big mission and purpose and vision, y'all, we are a part of something huge that has been going on for centuries. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. However, Israel was not able to love God. If you read the Old Testament, it was a mess when they tried to follow God. And guess what? Our lives are a mess too. We're just as messy and broken as they were. It just looks a little bit different because they had a lot more cows and stuff, you know. But that, the main command that we're talking about today is loving God. That's the first and greatest command. And so what does that even look like? And why should we even care about whatever that looks like? I think the Apostle John, who was with Jesus in one of his letters, He has something to say about that, and that's in 1 John 4.10, and it says this, Love consists in this, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Y'all, 
We were enemies of God. Before you trust Jesus, that is what you are. Because God is holy and he cannot tolerate sin. Like he, if he's going to be a good and righteous judge, he has to punish sin. And so it's not like we can work up the ladder to get there. It's not like we can do anything good on our own. We were legitimately enemies of God until he comes and saves us through Christ. That is our position. And it's not just what we do. Like the evil in us comes out of our, our hearts. Like I said, it's in our nature. And if you don't believe me, I want you to spend some time in two-year-olds. Because I'm telling you, you don't have to teach them to lie. You don't have to teach them to hit each other. You don't have to teach them to do anything like that. They just do it. And so you can see like the evil, it's not what we, it's not the, like Jesus said it himself, it's not what goes into the body that defiles you. It's what comes out. Like it's our heart that is separate and in opposition to God. And so that's, that's our position. That's where we are. And the back half of that verse says that Jesus was the atoning sacrifice for our sin. And that's like a really, it's a hard statement to kind of wrap your mind around if you never heard those words before. But really it means that Jesus took our place. He took the punishment that we deserve. And to help with a little bit of an illustration of what all that means, uh, I want to give you an illustration. So I have a brother. And say I go up and I take a couple steps, I slap my brother. Now, what is he going to do? Probably slap me back. Okay, that's fair. Now, say I go up to a teacher. Probably got teachers in the room. Say I walk up to a teacher, slap the teacher. What's going to happen? I'm probably going to get beat up, and I'm going to jail. So I'm in a jail cell now. For whatever reason, I get out on good behavior. I feel, well, I'm my hand's tingling. So I walk up, and I slap the cop. So what, more punishment. It just keeps getting higher. So I do my time, probably 10 years. I get out, and I want to take a trip to England. So I go to England, and I see the queen. I say, hey, queen, what's going on? I walk up. I slapped the Queen of England. That's probably the end of my slapping days, y'all. That, that is probably, I'm, that is it, I'm done. And so my question is, though, with that illustration, the punishment kept going up, but my action didn't change at all. It was the person who I was slapping that the punishment equals the person that I slapped. And so take that all the way up to God, holy, righteous, eternal. Y'all, we've all slapped God in the face, whether we know it or not. And so our punishment matches the person that we offended, and that's God. So if I'm in a courtroom, I'm standing there, all of my slapping, whatever it is, is, is laid before me. All of my sin, and when I say sin, I want to get real. I mean lying, pride, selfishness, whatever it is, sexual immorality, like all, all of it. We're all guilty in that courtroom. The verdict comes down. We're guilty. Punishment is coming its way, and Jesus steps in and says, I will take this punishment so he can go free. That is the gospel, and that is the blessing that we have in Jesus. And when you trust in him and you begin to follow him, you will have a new life that nothing else can touch. It's like nothing else that we can ever have in this world. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Like God is not a cosmic killjoy. We can enjoy his creation. And following Jesus is unlike following any other king. We look at our rulers all over the world. They're just like us, messy and broken. Jesus is nothing like that. He is a perfect king. And following under his rulership is so different than anything else we could ever have. And it is full of joy, love, and compassion. And so when we talk about that love, so first commandment, the big one is to love God. And when we trust and follow Jesus, that love begins to fill us up. And the intent is to have it pour out into others. And so that's what it means to, that's the big other point that we're talking about today is loving your neighbor. And I would argue that we can all have some kind of understanding of what that means. Like, if, you say, if I say love your neighbor, you mean, okay, I'm going to take, I'm going to maybe cut somebody's grass, be nice to the guy at Food Line or Starbucks, whatever it is. 
I'm going to love my neighbor and do it well. But for a Jew in that time, when Jesus said to love your neighbor, they would have took it like this. Okay, if Jesus is, tell, Jesus is telling me to love my neighbor, I'm going to love a Jew, no Gentiles, and I'm going to love someone who's in my status, socioeconomic, religious status, whatever it was. That's what it would have meant for them to love their neighbor. And so when we think about that, that is one of the main reasons why Jesus rubbed the Pharisees and Sadducees the wrong way, is because Jesus loved the unlovables, the people who would not have been welcome in the synagogue, lepers, prostitutes, maybe even tax collectors. Jesus was regularly hanging out, having lunch, having conversation with people that the Pharisees would have stayed miles from if they could. Jesus was right there with them, loving them right where they were, telling them to follow him. And that's it. And they hated him for that. They called him a friend of sinners. They called him a drunkard. He wouldn't have been called a drunkard if he was just drinking grape juice. He was, he, he was hanging out, enjoying his time with people. And they hated him for that. And so my question to y'all today is this. Who are the unlovables, the outsiders in our day? Who is that? My mind immediately goes to, well, and, well let me back up. When I say outsider, we would, we, I, I would believe everyone in this room would argue that anybody is welcome to come through that door. But they might not feel that they can. Who is that? Who is the outsider? I think of people in the LGBT, LGBTQ plus community, pro-abortion. I could, the, the list can go on. People who may not feel welcome in this room. Jesus was loving people just like that. And that's the question that we ask today is how would Jesus handle that? And the reason why I'm so passionate about helping us to look at who Jesus was and who he was loving and how he was doing it is because I am a Pharisee. I was a Pharisee. You can ask my wife. When I met her at 21, she is the first person to call me a Pharisee. She, t- she said it to my face, Tyler, you are a Pharisee. Y'all, it, it oh man, it, it was bad. Like, I was a KJV O guy, and what that means is King James Version only. And so I would say something, say this, and I meant it. If the king ain't in it, the king ain't in it. I would say that to people. I would say that to her. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm spitballing, man. I, I, I would, um, man, if you had tattoos, kingdom of God's not for you. If you cussed, come on now. God, man, God's not going to have that in his kingdom. If you drank, if you smoked, you, God did not allow you in his kingdom. That was me. That was the way I treated people and, talked, and thought of people. And it gets even worse. I, I knew that taking a sign to a gay pride event with some of the things that are on those signs, I knew doing that was wrong. But I would have never had lunch with someone who was gay or transgender. I would have never hung out with somebody who had tattoos or looked different than what I thought somebody who follows Jesus would. That, and when I look back on When I look back on how I treated people in my heart, and that God still loved me, and the way I saw people, and the fact that Jesus would have been right there with them, it breaks my heart to know that that's where my heart was. And, man, God has just done so much in my life to bring me to the place that I am right now. And so, thank y'all.
It was a class for Jesus. Um, man, one event that I, I mean, there's so many different things that have brought me to, the, to just, God is just working on my heart. I'm not there yet. He's continuously working on my heart. And so when I was at um, Liberty, I served in, a, in the LU Shepherd office. And so what that office was, was a place where, so the RAs on the campuses were the main responsibility to shepherd the students, like, you know, like cancel them, make sure they're okay, all, you know, all good, all, all that stuff. And so if they encountered issues that they didn't know how to handle or couldn't deal with, they just brought it up to us. And so I had a couple um, counseling sessions under my belt. And so they brought in a, a, a great dude and we, we sat down for our first session, and we're catching up, you know, doing the thing, all the, the pleasantries and all that kind of stuff. And so then we get to the issue, and so he tells me, he says, Tyler, I love Jesus. I'm following him. I know I'm adopted in his family, and I know I will never leave. God loves me so much that he sent his son to die for me, and now I'm just trusting and following him. And then he says, Tyler, I struggle with homosexual attraction. And y'all, when I say, I, I could not compute what was happening because he, he told me that he, he, he's following Jesus, loving Jesus, and this is his struggle. What God began to show me is Tyler, he's, he's broken just like you, but just in a different way. His, the struggles that he is walking through look different than yours. Because even at that time, I had just, I was struggling with pornography. Sexual sin. It just looked different. And so God was breaking the scales on my heart. Breaking the scales on my eyes. And he said, Tyler... This young man in front of you, that is your neighbor. Looks different than you, different struggles than you. That's your neighbor. And so what I want to communicate to y'all about that, my story, my journey, main thing is Jesus did not love me less or more back when I was acting like a Pharisee. The love has stayed the exact same. That has not changed at all. He has just been walking to, with me and helped me mature to look more and more like Jesus. That's it. There is, there's no like, he didn't let me love more or less at any point. He just helped me, walk with me to mature. And so, when we look at Jesus and how he was loving people that would not be welcome or would not, would not feel welcome, excuse me, he's calling us to do the same thing. And so even when I talk to, and I continue to talk with that, with that young man, the things that he was walking through and that he knew that unlike me, like I could go talk about my struggles with pornography really to, to anyone, to any other guy. But he knew that he, if he was to bring up what he was struggling with, he just felt like he would be ostracized by everyone. And so when I think about all these things, y'all, like our response to, to him, to anyone else, has got to look like Jesus. And, you know, that's not easy. I'm not, I'm not going to stand up, up here and act like it's so easy to, with, with the way our world is, like, I don't, it is, it's difficult. It's not easy. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how that looks. But that has got to be our response, is to look like Jesus. When people who don't look like us or act like us or any, like, I don't even want to say the word us. Like, we're all made in God's image and God has called us to love and walk with people who have different struggles than you do. That's what he's called us to do. And so in Luke's gospel account, he records another time where Jesus was asked 
by another law expert, like a similar question. And that question was, what can I do to inherit eternal life? So it's, it's kind of similar, but he gives a, a different response to that question. And so, well, not a different response. He gives, the, he gives the exact same response to that question, which is the Shema. And so, sorry, I'm, I uh, lost myself here. But when, that, when, the, when Jesus gives the Shema, he says, love God, love my neighbor. That law expert counters and he says, well, who is my neighbor, Jesus? And so Jesus gives the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so if you haven't heard that parable before, quick synopsis, Jesus describes a man who is on a journey. He is beaten and he is robbed and he is left on the side of the road for dead. And two of the most religious people of that day who should have been loving God and loving their neighbor better than anybody else, they cross on the complete other side of the road to not have to help that man. And so a Samaritan comes by, somebody who would have been hated by the Jewish people. He touches the guy, bandages his wounds up, takes him to an inn, and says, hey, whatever the charge is for him, just put it on my tab. And so Jesus finishes telling that parable, and he wraps it up by asking the law expert this question. He says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And the man responds by saying, the one who showed mercy to him. And then Jesus told him, you go and do the same. In that parable, the law expert could not even say the word Samaritan. That's how much he hated that guy, or would have hated that guy. But that's the call that Jesus has. And so the question that the law expert asked was, who is my neighbor? If I'm supposed to love God and love my neighbor, then who is that? But Jesus switches it, and he really just asks the question, instead of saying, who is my neighbor? He asks, how can I be a neighbor? Not to who it is, but just how can I do it? And so, y'all, like I said before, I don't have all the answers when it comes to how do we follow Jesus? Be true to his word, true to the commands and teachings, to the gospel, to all of that. But meet people where they are and love them the way he did. When Jesus was sitting with a leper, a, a prostitute, or a tax collector, he wasn't like co-signing what they were doing. He wasn't doing that. But yet they, they knew that he loved them enough to still invite him over to their house to have lunch. That would be my prayer for all of us, is that if we, we can find a way to stay true to following Jesus, to look like him so much, we can stand on the truth of his word and yet love anyone that comes across our path. And so a few ways that we can start to work in our heads to do that is just to look, to know that everyone is made in God's image. Every single person bears his image. No matter what you think of them, they do. And a couple ways that I've, I've just been working with this is to learn to listen. Listen to somebody's story. Listen to the issues they're facing, what they're walking through. And y'all, to go back to, L, to my time at L.U. Shepherds, like listening to him talk about, he's like, man, even though I struggle with this, like I still want a family. Like I want kids. I want to follow Jesus. I want people to, who have my same struggle to know that there's hope. Like I, just listening to his story helped me to see so much and how prideful and arrogant I was. So y'all, we can listen to people's story. Listen to whatever they're walking through, whatever they're struggling with. And we can also serve. We can serve. We can cut somebody's grass. You can invite someone over to your house for dinner, lunch, go hang out with them, get coffee. We can serve. We can listen and serve. We can model Jesus as he was hanging out with people who would not have been allowed in the synagogue, showing the true heart of God. Just telling them to follow him. It's the same call that God has for us today. 
We can do that in our community. You can walk across the street and do that. Loving your neighbor for you might take you to Africa, might take you to Europe, might take you to Asia. But that is the big mission, the big goal, the big purpose that God has had from the jump is for us to love him and love our neighbor, spreading the truth of the kingdom and the truth of the gospel. That is what God has called us to. And so Jesus, he answers the big question for us, like, what are we here for? It's to love God, to love our neighbor as ourself. And then we have the opportunity to do something about it. And so as we think through different things, ways we can take what we hear today and apply it, I have a few next steps for us this morning. So the first one here is trusting in Jesus for the very first time. If the gospel made sense to you for the very first time, if you put your faith in Jesus, and I'll pray about that later, but please let us know. Scan that QR code and please let us know because we want to help you get into community that they can, people can help you walk with Jesus. Because even in my walk with Jesus, like when I made my faith my own, that's when I became super arrogant. That's when I became like that Pharisee. And I just needed someone to help me to walk, to look more like Jesus every single day. And that's what we want to do with you. So the next one is memorizing 1 John 4.10. That's love consists in this. And the next one is just asking the question for yourself. How can I be a neighbor? Workplace, neighborhood, wherever you work out, like whatever it is, how can I be a neighbor where I am? And the last one is praying for the, the quote unquote outsider or the person who might not feel welcome to come here. And also the Pharisee, that they would follow Jesus. And that's all I have y'all this morning. So so let's go to God in prayer. Uh, God, I just thank you for this time. Lord, I just thank you for who you are. And God, I thank you for loving me in the place that I was in. Not that that love has changed, but that you've just helped me to mature. For anybody else whose story is similar to mine, or you've been hurt by somebody like me, I just pray, God, that you will heal their heart, help them to follow you. And Lord, if someone hasn't trusted you, and they want to, God, I just ask they'll pray a prayer. Like, like there's no special word, no secret sauce, just a, a heart that just wants to have Jesus. You say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner and that I need you. I pray, God, that you will be my father. And I just want to follow you as my king. And that's it. So, God, I just thank you for that, this time and these people. And I just pray their hearts and minds will be centered on you. In the name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yes. <laughs> wow, what a powerful word that we heard today and testimony. Um, didn't Pastor Tyler do such a great job? I'm still like, woo! <laughs> That was so great. I love this amazing reminder that we have that it, our goal, our mission is to follow him, to look like him, and then how that can overflow into the lives of others and all that we meet. Um, I have just a few quick things for us before we head out today. So we are really excited um, to be able to offer more opportunities to reach our community and to sit with people who are different than us, who who want to know more about Jesus, who are in need of the hope of him. And a great way to do that is to invite someone to come out to our next concert that's going to be happening on July 31st. We're really excited to have Jeffrey Lewis Polson with us here. And that's a great time where you can bring your cooler, have dinner. There's going to be food trucks, lots of fun. Fun, great music and just invite someone to come out and just be with you sit with us and we can learn each other's stories and have a great evening together um, and you guys we are really excited to be able to offer these things because you guys are also really passionate those who call believers home about being generous and giving to what is happening in our community so i also want to remind you all that we have the opportunity to worship through giving and you can do that here at believers 
on our website. You can also give on the Believer's Church app. And if you are here in person today, you can also leave your gift in the box on your way out. And for those of you who are um, have been giving here at Believers, we have giving statements ready. Yay, so exciting. Um, that's always fun to just celebrate that. When, when I see those statements, what I think about is like, God, you are showing up and when we are able to give to your kingdom to the work that is happening in our community so that people know they are welcome here so that they know that they can walk here and meet you they can meet us in the grocery store and meet you we get to see that reflected in those statements and it's just a reminder that jesus says i will provide i am doing this i got you so i hope that you guys have as much fun and if you also want a little help celebrating when you pick up your statements today you guys are helping to save on postage. That's so incredible. We are going to be giving out these super cute Believers Beach Bags. Everybody needs one of those for your beach trips. So make sure to swing by um, the desk on your way out so that you guys can pick up those statements. All right, with that, you guys, we are going to prepare ourselves to go out and be love. I am so excited to see y'all next week. Say hello to someone maybe that you don't know, and we'll see you soon.